Well, so far as we've been considering the first letter of Peter, we, we are, are seeing, uh, so we've seen three big things, actually, all that spring from the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we have learned uh, that the Christian is someone who has been chosen by God and purchased for God, through Christ's atoning death. We thought last time about how we have been ransomed. Ransomed is, is that, that phrase that has the idea of being a slave in the marketplace and someone pays a price for our freedom. And that is what God has done for us. He, is, he has purchased us. He has purchased our freedom, not with gold or silver that perishes, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as our spotless lamb who was uh, able to take our place to bear our sin so that judgment and death would pass over us. The Christian is someone who is purchased for God, we've seen. But we've also seen that the Christian is someone who has an inheritance from God, And this has been through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, then his resurrection gives us hope that death is not the end, uh, that, that we have acceptance with God, that our high priest, when he made that offering of sin at the cross at Calvary, it was accepted, it was pleasing in God's sight because just as the high priest in the temple would go behind the curtain and make the, the atoning sacrifice, putting the blood on the mercy seat, it was only if he came out of that uh, most holy place that the people would be sure God had accepted it, that God had forgiven their sins. And, and, and so uh, Christ, who has gone through the curtain and has come, come uh, through death and has been raised to life and exalted to the right hand of God, has given us a hope that defies death, uh, the hope of an inheritance in heaven, in God's new creation. And, and we have also seen, and we saw more last time, that the Christian is then someone who is called to be holy by God until the return of Christ. We we are living in this world as exiles, as sojourners, that's a temporary residence. We, We don't belong here, we belong to God. Our home is not here permanently, our home is in in a heavenly country to come that is being prepared for us by Christ in glory. And in the meantime, God says we are to live as holy people, which we saw means to to be like God because God calls us. He says, be holy, for I am holy. That, That means to be different from the world around us, to be distinct in in who we are, but not just who we are, how we behave also. But it also means to, to consider ourselves belonging to God. We are his. So the Christian is an exile who is simply traveling through this world to a heavenly home, a heavenly residence. And, and, and as they travel, see, we've also seen as they travel through that this world is, is, is and this journey is full of trials that might grieve us and enemies that hate us and are seeking to disrupt our peace and to ruin our faith. And doesn't it seem hard? Doesn't the Christian life at times seem difficult? And, and we may be left ask, asking the question, well, well Lord, why, why don't you just simply take us out of this world, immediately bringing us into our inheritance? Why Why do you allow us to to go through this world? If we belong to you, why do you allow us to go through trials? Why do you allow us to be in in danger of enemies, both uh, physical and spiritual? Why why not just, at the moment we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, why not just immediately bring us into the inheritance that you've promised to give us? You ever wondered that? You ever asked that? Well, in the passage set before us, this morning, Peter has an answer to that. You see, Peter, he has convinced us so far that though we are in the world, we are not, how does it go? 
of the world. It's an important, I know it's, a, it's an old saying. I know, I know we might associate it with, with, with other things, and, but, but it's, a, it's a true saying. It's, it's a helpful saying. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. We are holy. We are set apart by, by the grace and mercy of God. But now Peter wants to show us there's more, more to this saying than just in the world, not of the world. Actually, Peter wants us, to sh- wants us to know that we as God's people, as God's church, are in the world to be on mission to the world. Did you, re- did you get that? We are in the world to be on mission to the world. That, that we, when, when, we, when God tells us to be holy, when God sets us aside, he's not setting us aside to be a holy huddle that tries to escape the people who are not believers. God calls us to be a, a church that is like a, a lifeboat going out into the world to rescue lost souls for the glory of God. And so we're going to be considering uh, two things this morning. We're going to consider, firstly, the, the mission of God, but then we're going to consider the mission of God's people. Because before we understand what, what mission God has put us on as his church, we need to understand the mission he is on. Okay, so firstly, let, let's think about the mission of God in verses 4 through to 9. Did you ever consider this? You, you've heard all the stories of the different missionaries. I wonder your favourite missionary story. Uh, could, is, do you, uh, perhaps you, you've thought about Hudson Taylor, or, or maybe you, you've thought about um, uh, so Adon, is it Adoniah Judson, um, or maybe you've, you've thought about uh, various other, other missionaries. I don't know, have you got any favourite missionaries? Give them a call about. I'm just checking if you're awake at this point. Any favourite missionaries come to mind? William Carey. William Carey. Kramer. David Brainard. David Brainard. Fantastic. Yeah. Any others? Mary Slosson. Mar- Barry's got loads of them. Okay. Uh, so, so if you if you haven't read up on missionaries, I encourage you to do so, and perhaps go and ask Barry uh, to to point you in the right direction. But. All those missionaries, they're thrilling stories, they're they're inspiring stories of how they gave up their lives. Uh, Sometimes they they gave up their ambitions to go to a a place that they were unfamiliar with in order to tell others about Jesus Christ. At, at, At many times it cost them their very lives. But did you ever consider that who the first missionary is? Who the primary mission to a lost world is? It is always God. It is always God. He is the greatest evangelist there is. He is the God who is on mission. We ultimately have seen this in in his sending of his own son, Jesus Christ, into the world. Jesus who came behind enemy lines. Uh, God incarnate, God as flesh, dwelling among us. Reaching out to those who were dwelling in darkness. And it cost him his life. But we, we see, uh, see that while the cross and the resurrection may be the pinnacle of God's mission, it, that, that is where our salvation is found. They are not the end of God's mission. God continues to be at work in this world. God he continues to be doing something in this world. So what is it? What is his mission? Well, there's two aspects Peter brings our attention to. Firstly, it's to build a new temple. To build a new temple. Uh, look, look at the language he uses. He says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Here you've got the idea of a temple. Uh, Behold, he says, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honour is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected, more building, more stones, has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence, they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. 
So, so what Peter's saying here is, as you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, as you have come to him for salvation, God is building a spiritual house. This is a temple. And, and so to understand this, we, we really need to understand the concept of temple in, in the Old Testament. So you might want to go to, to 2 Chronicles 7. It's, it's not important that uh, too important you do you might want to just note it down 2 chronicles 7 uh, highlights the and and reports the completion of the temple Uh, king solomon the son of david was instructed to build a house where the the people could be sure that god's glorious presence would dwell it was a mammoth task or, or in constructing this building. But in Chronicles 7, we find this. Uh, Solomon has prayed over the temple, and this is what we read. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because of the glory of the Lord filled the house. When all the people saw the, of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is where God's glorious te- presence would be dwelling among his people. And inside the temple, there, there would be the priests. Priests who were, were called from the tribe of Levi. So only a select number of men who would then have the responsibility of leading the people in worship to God and in bringing the sacrifices for the people's sins. Sacrifices of animals. Uh, Very often they would bring sacrifices for the guilt of the people. They would bring sacrifices for the thanksgiving of the people. They they would lead in in sacrifices for the dedication of the people. All sorts of sacrifices, day and night. The priests would be there serving in the temple, leading the people in their worship. But, But this is the same temple that would be Uh, would come under attack from Babylon. This is the same temple that Herod would reconstruct. This is the same temple that the glory of the Lord would leave. This is the same temple that when Jesus Christ would go into that temple and proclaim himself to be the light of the world, to be uh, the the one who, who brings the salvation of Israel, what would the temple authorities do to him? They took the promised Messiah, they threw him out of the temple, they they delivered him into the hands of the Gentiles where he would be put up on a cross and executed. Peter says, Jesus is a living stone rejected by men, rejected by those who were worshipping God in the temple. And, And this living stone that was thrown out, that was delivered into the hands of of the Romans, rejected by his own people. All along, Peter says, God had, before before creating the world, had chosen him to be the cornerstone of a new building, of the spiritual house that God was going to construct, which is the church. And so as, as people, as, as, as those who come to Jesus Christ, Peter likens us to living stones. Stones that are being put together, different shapes and different sizes, uh, different strengths and different weaknesses, all being constructed into this spiritual house. And if a spiritual house, if, if God dwelt with the people in that temple a a temple made of stone, of bricks, of mortar, then how much more will God dwell with his spiritual temple? How much more will God be in his spiritual house, the church? 
Did, have you ever come, has that ever dawned on you? That the church is the most glorious place on earth because the church is where the, where, where, where the Lord of glory dwells. Yes, yes, we are each individually. In Paul would, Paul would say, yes, you are the Holy Spirit. Uh, you, sorry, not you are the Holy Spirit. You are the, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are where the Holy Spirit is, dwells as believers. But it's that. But but there's something bigger than just you and your faith individually. That we are being constructed, built together, to be a temple for the living God. And, and not, just, not just living stones, but Peter says, no, you're, you're also that priesthood. There, there, there's not just, you know, in, in Israel, there were the 12 tribes and the, the one tribe, the tribe of Levi, they were given the responsibility of being priests. The, the, you, if everyone else would have to go to God through those priests, but now because Jesus Christ has given the ultimate sacrifice, the, the sacrifice of sacrifices, the one that all those animal sacrifices pointed to, he has made the final sacrifice for our sins, that we are now, Peter says, all a priesthood. We are all priests to God. We have access into his presence through our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are able to, to come into God's presence and to live our lives as sacrifices for him. Do you see the glory? The glory of God's mission. He is, he is building a new temple. But, but his mission has a second aspect in verses 9 to 10. To make a new people. To make a new people. Exodus uh, 19 uh, is just before uh, the giving of the Ten Commandments. And in Exodus 19, after the people have been delivered from Pharaoh and slavery in Egypt, God promises them this in verses 5 to 6. He says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be, now, now listen for these words, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Do those words sound familiar? If, if, if we were taking notice in, in our reading, they would have sounded very familiar, because look at verse 9. Peter says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. All of those, it's not exactly the same, but that's clearly where Peter's mind is. He is, he is bringing these, this Old Testament idea, that, that how God described Israel, what they would be if they kept his covenant. And now he is bringing it into the new covenant. He is bringing it and using those similar words to describe the church. In, in Exodus 19, it was, it was with the condition that, of be, that they would be God's special people if they obeyed Exodus 20, if they obeyed his law, if they obeyed his commands. And what is the history, what is the story of, of Israel throughout the Old Testament? It is that as a, ho as a nation, as a whole, they broke God's covenant. They broke his law again and again. And it wasn't only that they broke his covenant, they also rejected his mercy. The saviour who had been promised through their prophets stood in the temple in front of them. And the, the, the authorities of the temple threw him out, rejecting him. Not seeing him as precious, not seeing him as chosen, but seeing him as a dirty thing to be thrown away. They were rejecting, in rejecting the saviour, they were rejecting the mercy of God. And so to them, Jesus has become the stone that, 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 that they rejected. The, he has become the cornerstone and he has become to them a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. And, and don't think for a moment this, this, uh, this stone of stumbling is, is like what... You know, one of those little paving slabs that be careful as you go outside that you might trip over and you know, you have a little stumble. And well, wasn't that funny? 
this stone of stumbling, uh, Isaiah would say in chapter 8, this stone of stumbling causes people to fall down and be broken. That is, that is what happened to, to those who called themselves God's people but who rejected, who rejected the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. But God has had a plan. And God, God has planned to, to choose a people who are not just of Jewish descent, but who are from every nation in the world. He has chosen to show his mercy to a new people, to to Jews and Gentiles, and and to make them one in Christ, to make them a new nation, a new people. Look what he says in, in verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God has has chosen uh, to to reveal his mercy to those who once walked in darkness. He has chosen to bring into light those who were who were in spiritual uh, terror. And he is uh, those who were in darkness, those who are under judgment. He has called them into his marvelous light to receive his mercy and to be his people. Now you may uh, go on on a website and you uh, Sometimes have to, when you're filling in a form, an electronic form, you have to choose what country you come from. And you, you scroll down the list of all these nations. One nation you will never find on that list is here described in verse 9. You will never find the chosen race, a royal priesthood, God's holy nation. You'll never find it. But across the earth, uh, across all the nations, within all the nations of the earth, you will find a spiritual nation. You will find, as it were, uh, a, a new people living for the glory of God, being light in the darkness. So, how do we become part of this new nation? How do we become part of this people? It is the same way as we become part of this new temple. Verse 7, the honour is for you who believe. You who believe. So can I ask you, have you come to faith in Jesus Christ? Because if we have believed in Jesus then we have become a precious and honoured people. Brothers and sisters, God is on, his, on mission in the world. God is on a mission to build a new temple. God is on a mission to make a new people out of, all, out of people from all the nations of the earth. But okay, you might be thinking this. Well, We've just been thinking, even in these last few weeks, about the bad treatment of Christians all over the world, haven't we? And in our own country, what do we find? We don't find so much as hostile persecution, but we find hostile apathy. We find churches closing. We find the number of believers diminishing. So we might be left asking, well, is God's mission succeeding then? Is it actually succeeding? We, we may be tempted as we hear about the churches being persecuted, about nations who don't recognise and authorities who, who don't recognise evangelical Christianity, and we say, well, is God's mission then really working? Is it, is it really succeeding? Or is it, is it just fizzling out? Well, brothers and sisters, if you're ever in, tempted to believe that God's mission is not succeeding, you need to remember the end of the story. Because we have an end of the story. We, have been, we are in a position where we have been given the spoilers to the end of the world. We, we have been told what God is doing and how it will all end. 
in, in Revelation 21. Go home later and, and read Revelation 20 and 21. And you will see a glorious picture that the Apostle John gives. We're, we're told there, John tells us in, in chapter 20, that God is going to be recreating the skies and the earth. He is going to be making it all new. And, and from the sky will come this new people. This holy city that God is building. And they will come down from heaven like a bride dressed for the wedding day. And, and they'll be without spot or blemish. And, and we're told that they, there on, on this recreated new creation, we will dwell with God. And God will dwell with his people. In that new creation, there will be no more sin, nor crying, nor grief, nor pain, nor death. But there will be the people of God as an innumerable multitude singing his praise for eternity. Will you be there? Singing his praise for eternity. Brothers and sisters, God's mission is not failing. Never think that. God's mission is succeeding and will succeed because the God who knows the beginning and the end is the God who will do these things. The mission of God will not and cannot fail. So we, we've considered the mission of God and, and we've done that very purposefully and, and very slowly. But now we're going to see the mission of God's people. The mission of God's people. And, and this is going to be much quicker because if we understand the mission of God, we will understand the mission of God's people. So what is our mission? Why is God building us together to be this new temple, this dwelling place for him on earth? What, what, what is God doing when he is making a new people? What is our purpose? Well, when you read the Bible, do notice the conjunctions, those connecting words and phrases. And they often give purpose. So look at verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That is the purpose. That. What, what, why, why, why is God doing this? What's God's mission? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Why does the church exist in the world? What is the purpose of the church? What mission are we to be engaged in? And it's simply this. To proclaim God's excellencies to a world that is ignorant of him. A world that is in darkness and does not see him. And does not consider Christ to be precious and reject him. Our purpose in the world is to be on mission to the world, proclaiming the greatness, the beauty, and the preciousness of our God in Jesus Christ. That is why we exist. But, but it's to proclaim God's excellencies, first of all, in words. Now, um, when Peter uses the word here, proclaim, do you know what he means? He means to tell out. He means to declare. He means to announce. It is not enough in our evangelism to only use our actions. You know how, 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 uh, some, how it's become a, a, a popular saying that um, you, you don't need to tell the gospel, you need to live the gospel? Well, you'll see in a moment that's true. But actually, the, the scriptures would tell us again and again that evangelism is a declaration. It means opening our mouths. If we haven't opened our mouths, if we haven't spoken, we haven't evangelized. When, when Peter uses the word proclaim, he really means proclaim, tell, speak. The church exists to proclaim to the world with words the excellency of God's saving works. We, 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 we have seen the importance of God's word in, 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 chapter, in chapter 1, verse 22 to, to 25. It is the preached word, Peter says, that God uses to cause people to be born again. And, and so uh, 
so when we are sharing, if we want people to be born again, we need to share the gospel with words. We, we need to emphasize, and, and as a church, this is why again and again in each of our mis- ministries of the church and any new ones in the future, we will be seeking to make the word central. Because it is by the word being preached that people are saved. So are you taking opportunities to tell others about what God has done for you when you were not a people, you are now God's people, that once you did not have his mercy but were under his judgment, but now you have received his mercy. So we we proclaim his excellencies with words, but also in deeds. Because the Christian's orthodoxy, their beliefs, are always confirmed by their orthopraxy, their practice, their, their ethical living. And so Peter says, verse 11 and 10, and just very quickly, it involves two things. It involves abstaining from those sinful desires that wage war against your soul, that are hostile to the commandments of God and the work of the Spirit in your life, and to be careful to keep your conduct among, in the eyes of the world as honourable before God. So share a little bit of a, a testimony of what I'm thankful to God for in my own story of conversion. I am thankful that those who witnessed to me both told me the gospel and had attractive lives of godliness. Because as they told me the gospel, I came to, be- to believe who Jesus was. But as I, li- as I saw their lives being lived out distinctly from my own life, without God and without hope in the world, their, their, the, their lives adorned their words. Their, their lives confirmed that what they said was true. That their saviour really made a difference to them. They, I saw the difference in how they spent their time. How they spoke to others. And these things began to draw me to the reality of Jesus Christ. But don't, and don't imagine for a minute that those you speak to about the gospel are not also watching you live to see whether you really believe the gospel, to see if the gospel really changes your life. Do you have a good witness? Do you have a good witness? Let me tell you what a good witness is from Peter, what, what Peter tells us a good witness is. A good witness will tell the truth about God without shame or embarrassment. A good witness will practice what is right in the eyes of God, even when the world tells us we are wrong. Even when the world sees the way you live and calls you foolish for doing so. Even when the world hears what you believe and says that you are archaic or outdated or that you are, you are a bigot in some form or shape. To to be a good witness is living for the eyes of an audience of one. To to be a good witness is not living for the world's vindication today. Because if we live for the world's vindication today, to say, pat us on the back and say, church, what a good church you are. What 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 wonderful people you are. How nice and how kind and how lovely. And and look, we hope for that, don't we? The answer is yes. But if we're just living for the world's appraisal, to pat us on the back and say, well done. We're going to be quickly disappointed. We're going to be quickly disappointed. Do not live for the world's vindication today because the world will look at us increasingly. It's happening. They will look at us and they'll say, you believe what? You believe what? You are not good. You are evil. I'm not making this up. Look at verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, you're living honourably. A good witness is even when they, the world does not vindicate you but the world accuses you, you seek to still be faithful to God and obedient to Him and live for Him and His pleasure. And so we, we, a good witness is to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ who when He was despised 
And when the world accused him of being an evildoer, he did not retaliate, but he committed himself to God and waited for the vindication that would come through his resurrection. And in the same way, we don't look for the world's vindication today. We look for God's vindication on the last day. We are a people who are God's precious people. We are a, his, his own possession. And we exist to join him in mission, to lead a world that is without him and without hope in praise, in the praise of a saviour, Jesus Christ.